Welcome to my channel, Midnight Stories, where you find horror stories that scare you. Before watching, please press like to support me in producing more stories. This helps in spreading the video and reaching more people. Thank you for your support and enjoy watching. My family goes camping in Joshua Tree twice a year. This has been going on for at least 60 years. I'm 28. And in that whole time, my family has only ever left early on two occasions. The first was when it rained up in the mountains and caused three inches of flash flood to wash out our camp at 4 a.m. The second time was much more terrifying, and none of us have an answer as to what actually happened. It's the first night of camping, and 12-year-old me is in the girls' tent with all my girl cousins, and about six of my male cousins are ten feet away from us in another tent. My parents are closer to the road, along with three sets of uncles and aunts. All in all, there are about twenty of us. Most of our tents are the kind you can zip open at the top to see the stars. And I always love doing that because I'm a bad sleeper and it gives me something to look at when everyone goes to sleep. At one point, I close my eyes and I start to fall asleep when a small pebble from the humongous boulder next to our tent falls on top of the tent. I'm used to this because birds or squirrels often knock small debris around when they try to get at our food during the middle of the night. I open my eyes and the first thing I see is someone appears to be standing on top of the boulder, about fifteen feet up in the air, looking down into our tents. The person seemed to be wearing tight clothing and was really skinny and oddly shaped. At first I tell myself that it's one of my male cousins because they had been trying to scare us all night. But the person was moving really weird. Its head was moving back and forth like a cobra, and it kept crouching down on all fours and crawling down the face of the rock closer to us, then crawling back up and pacing. At one point it looked up at someone making noise at another campsite, and its eyes gleamed in the moonlight. I'm also entirely sure that it did not have the skull shape of a coyote or a mountain lion. It had a flat face with no snout. So I'm laying in my tent, freaking out, and trying to rationalize what I'm looking at. A lot of time goes by, and this thing just continues to watch us and move its body in really strange ways. I think about screaming, but the thing keeps coming down the side of the rock, and I am afraid it would jump onto our tents and kill us. After some time I hear a, Hey, what the heck, hey, hey, what are you doing? It's my uncle. Suddenly, at like 3 a.m., everyone is awake. My female cousins are awake and confused, and two of my older male cousins jump out of their tent with an axe. For a few seconds the thing stays completely still, but then my aunt and several of my cousins see it and they all scream. Someone finds a flashlight and they turn it on, but the thing jumps off the backside of the rock. A couple seconds later it runs gallops out from behind the rock past our campsite. My uncle manages to shine a light on it for a second and I still don't have any idea what I saw, besides the fact that the thing definitely didn't have clothes on, but was naked and had a dark mark on its side that I mistook for spandex. We hear screaming and thrashing from another campsite and several of the guys in our group go over and investigate. Whatever the thing was escaped into another campsite and ran into a small two-person tent. When the rangers got there, it's 4 a.m. and everyone was confused. My uncle and the people at the other tent say that it was a naked person. I definitely don't think it's a person, and thankfully two of my adult male cousins had also spent some time watching it and being absolutely terrified by it. So they agreed with me. We give them all the details we could and one ranger tells us that it was probably a coyote or mountain lion with mange. The other ranger looks really, really concerned, and I think he went off into the night to look for it. Either way, it was way too big for a coyote, and I've tracked mountain lions back in college, and know for sure mountain lions do not move like that, nor look like that when they have mange. We all left and went home that night. Either there was a naked crazy person, a monster, or a mountain lion with mange running around, and it had spent at least an hour watching us. No thank you. We stayed in hotels for a couple of years after that, and I've camped there at least twenty more times since then, and I've never heard or seen anything like it since. I need a favor. Marcus, normally calm and collected, sounded anxious. I cradled the phone to my ear and responded, Sure, man, what do you need? I'm taking a group up Pine Ridge tonight, but I need to bail. Can you cover for me? 
Marcus and I were guides for day trekkers, a company that ran hiking trips out of the city. Our expeditions were favorites among city slickers who wanted to experience nature for no more than a few hours at a time. Recently, day trekkers had been promoting midnight hikes, post-sundown treks along easily navigable trails, usually accompanied by campfires and s'mores. I'd led a few groups up Bear Creek already, but so far Marcus had the monopoly on Pine Ridge. I'd never even led a daytime trip there. Ah, man, you know I would if I could, but I'm leading the Bear Creek hike again tonight. Oh yeah, that's right. Listen, I could take that one if you want to switch with me. I was confused. Don't they leave at the same time? I thought you said you had to bail. Well, yeah, it's just the Pine Ridge Trail. Marcus sighed, a low rush of air barely audible over the phone. I can't do that hike tonight. What do you mean? I just need a change of pace, you know? Marcus laughed, but his voice had an edge to it. Can't keep doing the same hike all the time. I guess. So, can you cover for me? I couldn't shake this uneasy feeling that Marcus wasn't telling me something. Still, I owed him for the many times he'd covered for me in a pinch, so I said, Sure. Thanks, Owen. You're the man. I pulled up outside the 7-Eleven to a crash of thunder. The weather had started out dismal and only gotten worse. Two of the group had already called to cancel, leaving only seven, eight, including myself. As I turned off the ignition, I spied the huddled group of seven outside the sliding glass doors. Sorry I'm late, guys. I yelled over the downpour as I threw the van doors open. The group crowded into the van, pulling off their wet rain gear and shaking drops of water out of their hair. I'm Owen, I said, smiling. And you must be the only brave souls in the city willing to go on a hike in this. I gestured to the torrential rain and the group chuckled in unison. Anxious to get on the road, I rushed the group through quick introductions and passed out the waivers. Over the scratch of ballpoint pens, I thought back to Marcus's phone call. After I'd agreed to take over the Pine Ridge hike, we'd gone over the route together. Marcus assured me it was an easy hike. Actually, his exact words were, My two-year-old could do it. Still, I grilled him about the area as I poured over my trail map, my eyes roaming over the crisscrossing red lines. You'll be starting from the park and ride on Route 87. See where the blue trail starts? Follow that all the way to Pine Lake. It's a straight shot. Marcus paused before adding, Just one thing to look out for. You see where the red trail crosses the blue one just over a mile in? I followed the line with my finger, stopping where the two paths met. Yeah, I see it. It's easy to take a wrong turn in these woods. Keep an eye on the markers, and whatever you do, don't miss the turnoff for the blue trail. Marcus's voice dropped to a near whisper. Do not go down the red trail. I shuddered at Marcus's warning, wondering what had him so nervous about the red trail. Why not? What do you mean, why not? You'll never get back to the car if you follow the wrong trail, dumbass. His voice was back to his normal, cheery tone, and I dropped the subject. In the front seat of the van, surrounded by eager hikers, I shuddered again. The rain hit the windshield in a thundering cadence, and my heart raced to match it. Get it together, Owen, I scolded myself. Putting on a winning smile, I turned around in my seat to face the group. Once again, my name is Owen, I said as I collected the signed waivers. I've been working with day trekkers for almost a year now, and have been hiking all over the world for practically my whole life. I decided not to tell them I'd never hiked this particular trail before. Tonight's trip is going to be a fairly easy one as long as everyone brought their required gear. I ran down my mental checklist. Does everyone have water? Snacks? A flashlight? Nods all around. I turned to Dave, who'd climbed into the passenger seat. All right, man, you're the DJ for the drive. Dave grinned and flipped the radio to a classic rock station, and I pulled out onto the road. We were off to Pine Ridge. I think we lucked out, I said as I pulled into the park and ride, staring up at the sky. Looks like the rain's stopping. Sure enough, the rain had slowed to a drizzle, and I could even see the darkening sky through patches in the clouds. The sun had already dipped behind the mountain, but if only the clouds would clear, the moon would be bright and big in the sky tonight. The group piled out into the parking lot. Kara, a college-aged chick with a shock of blonde hair, jumped out first, followed by her friend April, a pretty Asian girl. 
Dave, an IT tech in his late twenties, hopped clumsily out of the passenger seat. On the ride over, he'd revealed that this was his very first hike. Next out of the van was Mike and Elena, a cheery, middle-aged couple. They were on their third trip with day trekkers, they said, though this was their first trip up Pine Ridge. The sixth hiker was Monica, a shy, heavy-set woman who'd signed up for the hike along with a friend from work. That friend had canceled at the last minute on account of the rain, but Monica didn't seem discouraged. That just left Jordan, a quiet guy with a fiery red beard, who'd only uttered a soft hello during the half-hour-long drive to the mountain. Mike and Elena stretched as Kara and April posed for pictures in front of the van. I pulled my pack out of the back seat, grunting as I hoisted it over my shoulders. The bag was laden with a few pieces of firewood and two full water bottles. Okay, guys, I need a volunteer. I have some pretty heavy things I need you to carry up to the lake for me. The hesitant looks turned to smiles as I pulled two bags of marshmallows out of the back. Mike and Elena each threw a bag into their packs, and Monica grabbed the graham crackers and chocolate. We set off across the damp grass towards the beginning of the trail. I could see three blue markers on a large tree trunk. I stopped the group in front of the tree. We're staying on this path. I tapped the tree with my hand. The blue path tonight all the way to the lake. As your guide, I'll be up front the whole time following the trail, but you should still learn to read the markers. I pulled out my flashlight and aimed it at the blue rectangles. They shone brightly in the light. I gave the hikers a rundown on the shapes and symbols used to mark the trails in the area and what each one meant. I see the next one, Dave shouted. His flashlight beam glinted off a small blue marker a little ways down the trail. Excellent. Then that's where we're headed. The eight of us set off into the forest with darkness fast approaching. Our flashlights had come out about ten minutes into the hike, once twilight had decidedly turned into night. I'd equipped my headlamp, and I glanced back every now and then to make sure the group was keeping up. Sure enough, each time I counted seven bouncing lights in a line behind me. Once everyone had crossed the bridge, we stopped for a water break. Despite the chilly night air, I stripped off my jacket, and the rest of the hikers followed suit. Nothing like some good hiking to get the blood pumping. Does anyone know where we go from here? I asked. The path was clear, but I wondered who'd been keeping an eye on the markers. Beams of light crisscrossed the night air as everyone tried to find the marker first. There it is, Jordan said, speaking aloud for the first time in ages. No, wait, that one's the wrong color. Surprised, I twisted my head to see where his light was pointing, but he'd already swung the beam further into the woods. I shone my own flashlight into the brush but was only met with dark forest. Jordan, I said, what color marker did you see? Um, it looked red to me, he said. I think. A slow chill crept its way up my spine. The red trail shouldn't be this close, not yet. Marcus's words came back to me. Do not go down the red trail. Oh, I see the blue one, Kara cried. She pointed to the shining blue rectangle just a few yards from the red marker. Excellent, Kara, I said, brushing off the sense of unease that had wormed its way into my mind. We're about a third of the way to the lake, guys. You're doing great. Let's keep up a good pace. Kara saw it first. I had my head down, watching my step among the slippery rocks when she said, That means turn right, doesn't it? Hmm. There, she said, pointing to the tree I'd just passed. Two sets of markers adorned the bark, red leading to the left and blue leading sharply to the right. I'd almost headed left down the red trail. I froze in my tracks. You're right. Good catch, I said, distracted. I was staring down the dark path ahead, my hands balled into fists. You would have walked right by it, Kara laughed. We would have never made it to the lake. Uh-huh. My breath billowed in the cold. Something seemed off, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Marcus's vague warning was getting to me, that was all. He probably didn't even mean anything by it. I shook my head, trying to clear away the fear that was creeping its way into the back of my mind. It was as I turned my head, side to side, the headlamp's beam dancing its way across the forest, that I realized what was amiss. No light reflected back off the trail ahead. My faithful headlamp that could light the deepest forest on the darkest night wasn't even penetrating the darkness before me. I could see the path a few feet ahead, and a few bushes and trees surrounding it, but past that, nothing. Blackness, a hole in the world. 
What's at the end of the red trail? Kara was asking, I think, for the second time. She'd already started down the blue trail, but was looking back at me curiously. I tore my gaze away and caught up to her. Seven dancing lights followed me up and away from the eerie blackness. I don't know. Wow. Oh, wow. Kara looked up in awe. Just wow. Monica put her amazement into words. I haven't seen a sky like that in ages. Look at all those stars. The sky had cleared completely by the time we made it out of the woods, and with the moon shining in all its splendor, even I had to admit it was an incredible sight. I nearly gasped when we made it over the rise and the lake came into view. The water glittered in the moonlight, and the mountain range in the distance was patterned with spectacular shades of black. Nothing beats this kind of view, Elena said appreciatively. She and Mike stood arm in arm by the still water, admiring the vista. I unloaded the firewood from my pack and went about starting a campfire. Kara and April offered a hand, and with the help of a bottle of lighter fluid, we had a roaring fire in minutes. The group crowed in delight once the bags of marshmallows came out, and soon our mouths were stuffed with s'mores. Dave tried leading everyone in a half-hearted campfire song, but no one made it past the first verse before trailing off into silence. It was a nice silence, though, a moment of calm away from the madness of the city. I was actually a little surprised by how still the lakeside was. During my trips up Bear Creek, we'd always run across at least one group out hiking or camping. Here we seemed to be the only people on the mountain. I glanced at my watch. Check it out, guys. It's midnight in three, two, one, they chorused, and then erupted in loud cheers. The whoops and shouts echoed across the lake, bouncing back in mock reply before fading into silence. Step and step and step and step and step and look back. Three, four, five, seven dancing lights met my gaze. Everyone's here. And I turned back around. Step and step and step. The way back was quieter. The hikers' stomachs were full of s'mores, and the cold had set in a little firmer. I kept my head down, watching my feet as we crossed rocky terrain, my footsteps keeping time more diligently than my watch. Step and step and step. Look back. I counted the seven beams of light once again and resumed my progress. There was something so calming about hiking at night. The air smelled cool and earthy from the recent rain, and the forest was soundless, save for the wet crackle of leaves under our feet. Even the way our headlamps and flashlights swept across the forest floor was soothing. Long shadows angled across the path as the eight separate beams of light mingled with one another. My headlamp flickered. I groaned to myself, hoping I'd thrown spare batteries into my pack. I had, hadn't I? Either way, the light wouldn't go out just yet. I had plenty of time. The path was getting rockier. It looked more overgrown than I remembered on the way here, like the woods was trying to reclaim the trail. Actually, it looked a lot different than I remembered. I whipped my head up, glancing left and right in search of a blue marker. Through the dense underbrush, I spotted a shining rectangle, red. I stopped dead in my tracks, staring hard at the red marker, hoping to make out a blue one on the same tree trunk, or at least nearby. Unfortunately, no amount of staring made a blue marker appear. Footsteps approached behind me as the group caught up. Whoops, I said. I think we made a wrong turn back there. Silence. Someone, Kara most likely, stopped beside me, her footsteps soft on the wet leaves. She must have lost her footing because a second later I felt a light touch on my back, an unsteady hand grasping me for support. Trying to stay focused, I peered straight ahead looking deep into the brush. Anyone see a blue marker anywhere? Again I was met with silence. Any, my words caught in my throat as I spun around. I saw my group, my seven lights behind me, but the closest was still a few yards away. I recognized Kara's blonde hair as she jogged to my side. My back still tingled where moments ago that small hand had rested so lightly against it. Jeez, Kara panted, resting her hands on her thighs. You're hard to keep up with. Thankfully, the glare of my headlamp kept her from seeing the fear on my face. Still, my voice wavered as I said, I thought you were right behind me. Someone was right behind me, I wanted to say, but I held my tongue. I glanced nervously into the trees, searching for whoever had been standing by me not even a minute ago. I think we made a wrong turn somewhere along the way, I said again, pointing to the red rectangle. 
Kara peered into the darkness and laughed. Because I wasn't there to stop you again, she teased. I managed a half-hearted chuckle. Keep an eye out for a blue marker, I called out to the group as they caught up. We must have passed the fork in the road a little ways back. Flashlight beams flared out at all angles as we searched. The group fanned out in different directions. Or if you see another red one, we can follow that back to the blue trail, I said. I stepped closer to the one red marker I could see and turned around, knowing that another marker should be visible from that one. I panned my light back and forth, hoping to glimpse a gleam from out of the darkness. Could that be it? A small glint of light reflected back at me. It wasn't where I thought the path should be, though, and I couldn't even tell what color it was. But something was shining back at me from the forest, a shimmering pinpoint of light. I cautiously moved forward. My headlamp flickered again, this time going dark for a full half-second. The mysterious light wavered but didn't go out. Found it. Jordan's voice echoed through the trees, in the opposite direction of where I was looking. I glanced over my shoulder and saw my hiker's seven lights gathering together about forty feet from where I was standing. Before heading back to the group, I glanced back at the strange light. It was gone. A chill, unrelated to the cold night air, flooded my veins. I rushed back to the group without looking back. Jordan looked smug as he pointed to the tree trunk. Blue to the left, red to the right. I clapped him on the shoulder. Awesome work, man. Should have had you in the lead this time. Disappointed. That was the word. I was disappointed with myself. How many times had I been out in the woods at night? I didn't even know the answer to that, but I knew it was a lot. And I'd never, ever been freaked out before. And yet something about that mistaken detour had my hair standing on end. Jordan had gotten us back to the blue trail just fine, and I'd kept a wary eye on the markers ever since, but I was beyond ready to be out of these woods for good. Step and step and step and step. The same mantra as before, only faster. My feet scrambled over rocks and through mud, trying to keep up with my steady chant. Step and step and step. Look back. I tried not to trip over the rocks as I counted the dancing lights behind me. One, two, three, four, five. My boots skidded on a slick boulder, but I regained balance. Six, seven, eight. Eight? I whispered aloud, chiding myself for miscounting. I paused for a moment to catch my breath and again tallied the lights behind me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. My heart skipped a beat. The group was spread thin along the path, but there was no mistaking it. There in the distance was an additional light. Kara was the front runner of the group again, and she unslung her backpack as she caught up. Water break? I nodded dumbly, not really hearing what she'd said. All of my senses were focused on the eighth light. The final light in line hung back from the group, but was slowly and surely making its way down the path towards us. It's just another hiker. A small voice of reason spoke up within me. A less welcome voice answered. There was no one else up at the lake. There weren't even any other cars in the parking lot. We're alone on this mountain. So what are you saying, Owen? I whispered to myself. Hmm? Kara raised an eyebrow. Nothing. Put your water away. We have to go. Kara might have been shocked by my clipped tone, but that was the least of my worries. I could see Mike and Elena closing in, and if everyone stopped for a rest, well, I wasn't ready to find out what would happen when the eighth light caught up. I started down the mountain again, with mild cries of protest from an exhausted Mike and Elena behind me. We're almost there, I lied. We can rest in the van. I was practically jogging, wet leaves dragging across my face as I sped through the trees. My step-and-step -step mantra was replaced by, get to the van, get to the van, get to the van. My mind was racing faster than my feet, and by the time I hit the first bridge, I swore I could hear my name whistling through the trees. Owen? No, I wasn't imagining it. Kara's voice called from behind me. Owen! I didn't slow down. I couldn't. Fear fueled my muscles, keeping me going. I glanced back again, terrified of seeing the eighth light, but this time I could barely even see the lights at all. I'd abandoned my hikers, but somehow I couldn't bring myself to feel anything but fear. With the darkness of the forest pressing in around me, I ran on, led by my headlamp, my own personal talisman. With a flicker and an apologetic click, my headlamp went out. The moonlight wasn't strong enough to break through the trees and warn me of the slanted rock ahead. My foot hit it at a hard angle, 
and I fell to the ground. Gasping, I clutched my ankle, rocking side to side on the damp, cold earth. Owen! Kara came into view, her flashlight beam bouncing along the ground until it landed on me. What happened? She sounded more frustrated than concerned. Light went out, I managed to hiss through gritted teeth. I worked my ankle in a full circle, touching it gingerly, not broken. I hurried to my feet, despite the pain, and swung my backpack around, tugging at the zipper. What are you doing? Sit back down. You're hurt. I need your light, I said. I have extra batteries in here somewhere. Kara handed me her flashlight, but she'd lost her patience. What's your problem? You left everyone behind. We're all beginners here. You can't expect us to go at your pace. I didn't know what to say. All I could think was, the light's getting closer. I kept fishing for my batteries, first in one pocket and then the other. I heard more voices approaching. It sounded like Mike and Elena were again the next in line. I was about to lose hope when my fingers closed around two tiny cylinders. AAA batteries. I almost cried in relief. Pulling my headlamp off my head, I handed the flashlight back to Kara. Shine this over here. Why, so you can fix your light and take off again? You know, we all paid a lot of money to go on a hike, not to get ditched in the woods. Despite her anger, Kara held the light steady for me. With shaking hands, I opened the battery case and pulled out the old ones, dropping them in my pack. Kara was ranting as she looked back at the approaching group. Dave even said he'd never been on a hike before, and you heard how much trouble he was having on the way to the lake. And April already fell once. You didn't even know that, did you? Monica and Jordan... She trailed off, staring at the dancing lights behind us. I could hear her counting to herself under her breath, and her eyes grew wide. Eight, she breathed. Kara turned back to me as if in slow motion, cocking her head in confusion. Weren't there only... I nodded, no longer trying to mask the fear written plainly on my face. Kara sucked in her breath, and the flashlight shook as her hands began to tremble. The wind picked up, sending the leaves into a frenzy. I'd placed one battery in the slot, but the second slipped out of my shaking fingers. No. I looked at Kara in terror, then down at the ground. Without a word, we dropped to our hands and knees, sifting through the dead leaves for the battery. Mike and Elena arrived as we were searching. Mike said testily, You were going at a pretty good clip there. Everything okay? My mind was still focused on finding the battery, but Kara was quicker on her feet than I was. Flash flood warning, she said. Didn't you hear Owen say it back there? I almost laughed. There was no way they'd buy that. The rain had stopped hours ago, and even so, there was no cell service on the mountain. Where would a warning have come from? Oh, dear, Elena said. We'd better move quickly then. I breathed a sigh of relief. Keep heading that way, I pointed down the hill, and follow the markers. I'll meet you by the van. My fingers dug through the muck, coming up empty each time. I groaned in frustration. How hard could it be to find one battery? Kara held her flashlight in one hand and rummaged through the dirt with the other, her fingernails caked with black grime. Mike and Elena disappeared down the path just as April approached us. Go on ahead, Kara told her friend. There's a flash flood warning. We need to get off the mountain right away. Thanks, I muttered to Kara as April passed. Why don't you share my flashlight? Kara whispered. I'll try to keep pace. That was the smart answer, of course, but I didn't feel safe without a light of my own. What if we got separated? I want to keep looking, at least till everyone's passed. Then I added, you can go if you want. Kara said nothing. She only shifted on her feet to search another area. The wind howled louder as the four remaining lights drew nearer, swaying ominously in the darkness. Jordan was the next to arrive, helping a sheepish-looking Monica along the rocky path. He took the news of a flash flood warning without batting an eye, and the two continued on down the hill. Dave followed soon after, huffing and puffing as he stumbled by. At least I'm not in last place, he joked, gesturing to the light behind him. Kara and I paled, but Dave continued on, unaware of the danger that lurked behind him. As soon as Dave was out of earshot, Kara grabbed my arm. Let's go! she pleaded. I shook my head. It has to be here. I dropped it right here. Owen, come on. She tugged at my arm. We have to go now. I ran my hands across the ground frantically. Just another minute. We don't have another minute. Kara stood up, her breath coming in gasps. 
The eighth light shone through the trees just up the path, sending shadows across her face. Oh, and it's coming! Go! I shouted. I regretted the word as soon as it was out of my mouth. Kara bolted, and as soon as she left, I was plunged into pitch darkness. Darkness broken only by the steadily advancing eighth light. Blood pounded in my ears, and it was all I could do not to look up right into the glow. Still, that couldn't stop me from seeing where the light cast its rays, creeping across the forest floor, moving more like a living thing than a flashlight's beam. My fingers scrambled blindly across the ground, searching desperately for the small metal cylinder as if it were the last thing I'd ever do. My fingers touched metal, cold metal, the battery. In a flurry of leaves and dirt, I jumped to my feet just as the eighth light rounded the bend, shining straight at me in full force. I averted my eyes and broke into a run even before placing the battery in its case. No more than twenty feet down the path, I almost took another tumble on an unsteady rock. With the rest of my waning courage, I forced myself to slow to a brisk walk. Better than breaking a leg and not making it the rest of the way down the mountain. As long as I was faster than the light, I'd be okay. At least, that's what I told myself. And yet I had no idea how fast the light was moving. It was impossible to tell from the shifting shadows, and there was no way I was going to turn around and check. All I knew was that it was behind me, and like Orpheus leading his love from Hades, I marched onward, staring dead ahead. With an unsettling jolt, I realized I could feel the light on me, like the warmth of a fresh sunburn. No, more than that. It felt moist, like hot breath. I shifted uncomfortably, sliding my jacket up over my shoulders and sped up the pace a little. My chant picked back up. Get to the van, get to the van, get to the van. I added in a few, I'm going to kill Marcus's and a couple words that I wouldn't have been able to repeat in front of the group. It took me a while to realize I'd been saying this out loud, in whispers that could have been screams if I'd only had the strength for it. I trudged on, the light to my back. It felt like a whole day had passed, or maybe a year. Later, my watch told me it was more like fifteen minutes, but like all things good and bad, it came to an end. The sight of the van, parked under a single streetlight, was the single most beautiful thing I'd seen in my life. The group had all made it back all right and was crowded outside the van, eating the last of the graham crackers and Hershey bars. Only Kara had kept an unwavering eye on the entrance to the woods, and I met her gaze as I stepped out of the trees. I will never forget her face that night. At first I thought she was looking right at me. My stomach dropped when I saw her skin turn white as a sheet, her mouth gape open in fright, and her eyes grow so wide I thought they'd never stop. Why is she looking at me like that, I thought. I'm sure I look like hell, but is it really that bad? Then I realized she was looking behind me. I never asked her what she saw come out of the forest that night. Whatever it was, it was gone when I spun around. All I saw was darkness and shadows, and I was glad. Some things are best left in the woods. Marcus texted me as I was dropping the van off. How was the hike? I had a few choice words to say to Marcus, but I wasn't about to get into it by text, so I said nothing. A few minutes later, Marcus called. You okay, Owen? I'm fine, I said tersely. Marcus was quiet for a moment, then he asked, So how many people went out on the hike? Seven, I replied. Another pause. I swore I could practically hear Marcus thinking on the other end. It was ages before he responded, his words tense and deliberate. How many more came back? While others can find forests unsettling in the dark, I've always found that there is something uniquely tranquil about walking through a forest at night. There would be no one but me, and the sound of the wind through the trees, the rustling of small animals through the leaf litter, and the sound of the forest floor crunching beneath my boots. I had decided to take a walk through the woods of my hometown. I always did this when life got too much, and today I needed to clear my head. Ah. Uh, Peace and quiet, I said to myself as I began the hour or so walk I had taken countless times before. The walk ended at a beautiful lake that I used to play around in when I was a child. That's where I had to be, where I needed to be. The lake always had a way of making me feel great nostalgia for a past life I wished I could back to, a life I would never forget. The moonlight lit most of my trail, and for a while I had no need for my torch. 
The forest made its familiar sounds. What I wasn't expecting was a low grumble of thunder in the distance. Oh no, please don't rain. I wasn't dressed properly for a storm, but nothing was going to stop me from my destination. I continued. I knew the woods like the back of my hand. Every tree, every rock was like a navigation tool for me. The lake wasn't far, maybe half an hour or so away, and that's when I heard something that caught me off guard. A laugh, I'm sure it was. It was faint and clearly off in the distance. It was a woman's laugh, not a maniacal laugh, but a playful giggle. This was enough to make me feel somewhat uneasy. However, I told myself that it must have just been a sound of the forest or some sort of animal, and I continued on. I made it to the lake and found a place to sit. The moonlight bounced of the water, illumining the whole lake. I grabbed a stick and moved it through the lake, listening to the sound of the water gently ripple. I sat there for a long time and had completely forgotten about the giggle I heard earlier. I didn't want to leave, but the hour was growing late and I thought it was about time I get back. So I stood myself up and then... I gasped. Across the lake there was a woman. She caught me by surprise. Why was she out here this late? I noticed that, strangely, she was naked. She wasn't horrifying, but beautiful, however. It was a cold night. So my immediate thought was that she was in danger. Hello, are you all right? She didn't respond, just stood there looking at me and smiling. There was a low rumble of thunder again, and the approaching clouds started to cover the moon. I couldn't see her anymore. All I heard was a quiet giggle echo across the lake. All the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I didn't know why. I wanted to go around the lake and try to help her, but something was telling me that I needed to leave. Now. I turned around and started to go back the way I came, but every step I took I heard the unmistakable sound of footsteps behind me. I felt eyes on me like daggers on the back of my head. I didn't turn around. I was scared. Was it her? What did she want? I didn't turn around. I carried on walking until I heard a whisper from behind me. Turn around. I jumped out of my skin and quickly turned around to find her behind me, standing with her arms straight down by her side like a soldier standing to attention. I turned on my torch and pointed it at her. There was something not right. Her teeth were black and her eyes. They had no iris, just two white eyes with a pair of tiny pupils. Her grin stretched across her face and as she smiled and black liquid seeped from the corner of her mouth, don't forget, she said, followed by yet another playful giggle. With this, she slinked back slowly into the forest and disappeared behind a tree. I didn't follow. I turned around and walked as quickly as I could. I knew that if I ran, I would lose my way, and it was beginning to rain. It was so dark now that all I could see was what my torch was illuminating. I finally came to a clearing where the path diverged into two. I recognized the tree that stood between the two paths, I had seen it countless times before. No, what I, was it? Is it left or right? Shit! How could I not remember? I've walked this trail a hundred times. It was like muscle memory to me. Okay, think, think. It's left. It's gotta be left. I walked quickly down the trail to the left, and almost as soon as I did, I heard that fucking laughter again, but this time it was loud and hysterical. I shone my torch through the trees. The laughter sounded like it was coming from all around me until it stopped abruptly. I turned my attention back to the path, and there she stood. She wasn't smiling anymore, just staring at me. Her appearance seemed to have changed once again. Her arms had become unnaturally long, almost touching the floor, and her skin was deathly pale and gray. She took one step forward towards me, and I took one step back. She whispered, Don't forget. The smile reappeared on her face and the black liquid poured out of her mouth again, this time like a river of blood flowing down her neck and chest. I was frozen in fear, watching her as she bent down onto all fours and crept slowly around me, disappearing once again. It took me a while to snap back into reality. I scanned the forest in front of me. I couldn't remember anything. The path ahead, the trees, everything looked alien to me. All I could do was follow the path ahead of me and hope to God that it leads me out of the woods. The forest was quiet now. The rain had stopped. No wind, no rustling of leaf litter, no crickets, no birds, nothing. I tried to remember how long I had been on this path, but I seemingly had no memory of anything besides the woman. I didn't even remember how I got to the forest or why. I stopped in the middle of the path, desperately looking around for anything that would jog my memory. 
All the while the deafening silence continued. Not a damn thing could remind me where I was or how to escape. As my eyes glanced around, they fixed to something irregular. There seemed to something calved on a tree. I slowly walked forward and realized they were words. When I got close enough, I could read those words. Don't look at it. Don't listen to it. My torch started to flicker. No, 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 please no. I hit it against my palm until mercifully it sprung back into life and then the forest wasn't quiet anymore. I could hear breathing, heavy, labored breathing, almost like someone having an asthma attack. I shone my torch toward the noise and saw a hand clutching the side of a tree. I couldn't see the body, just the hand, but it was so far up the tree that this thing must have been at least eight feet tall. The breathing didn't stop and my torch began to flicker again as whatever this thing was began to move. It tilted its head slowly around the tree to look at me. Two huge white eyes gazed into my very soul. I wanted to close my eyes and press my hands over my ears, but I was frozen again. Look at me, it said. It then took a slow giant step out from behind the tree to reveal itself to me. The smile had returned to its face, and it never looked more unnatural than it did at that moment. It was huge. It was even taller than I thought, almost as big as the trees it moved through. Its arms were long and bony, and its spine was twisted and contorted. It struggled as it moved slowly towards me, as if its body was being controlled like a puppet. It then stopped in front of me and slowly bent down to walk on all fours, its body clicking and snapping as it did. Listen, it said. It was inhaling its words as it spoke as if it was gasping for air. Its smile stretched further across its emaciated gray face, and its cold white eyes didn't blink. As if nothing could get any worse at that point, my torch gave in and died. I was in complete darkness. I couldn't see a thing. I could hear it getting closer as my legs began to tremble and give way. I fell to my knees. The air smelt more and more like decaying flesh the closer it got to me, and the sound of breaking bones as it moved itself across the floor was getting louder and louder until I could feel its breath on my face. I closed my eyes as tears started to roll down my cheeks. I braced myself for the end, and then I felt a cold hand brush my cheek, wiping away the tears from my face. Goodbye, it said, and the all the sounds were gone once again. That was the last I saw of it. I'm still here. I don't remember my name. I don't know this place. Why am I here? How to get out? I don't remember. I don't remember. I was a park ranger on a small island, the only year-round resident. Private boat access only with no bridge or ferries. It became crowded in summer, but we'd empty out completely when the weather turned. I loved the off-season with 400 acres all to myself, no phone, no internet. Sometimes, though, I would get bored. I'd go out at night without a flashlight and challenge myself to hike the entire island in the dark. There was moonlight to navigate by, but there was also a stretch of the main trail that passed through the oldest trees on the island where I'd be plunged into total darkness. I was in the old forest one night when I heard something behind me. I turned, nothing there, turned back, and something brushed my face. My stomach dropped and I swung my fist into something. I ran full tilt for a hundred yards, stomping in my big stupid boots with my gun belt bouncing up and down, my vest riding up to saw my throat. I stopped and bent over with a stitch in my side and started laughing. I held my hand in front of my eyes and ran my fingers over the prickled cut from the branch I'd punched. Through the spread fingers of my injured hand I saw a smear of bright white off-trail ahead. I figured it was one of a small herd of white-rumped deer the locals wrongfully referred to as palominos, but it moved up a side trail before I could get a better look. I got my breath under control and followed. A hundred feet up the side trail, it split again and I could hear something moving through the underbrush just past the fork and to the right. I crouched as I made my way to the fork and stayed low trying to keep quiet and unseen. The trail gains elevation as it nears the center of the island where the trees spread out and the moon lights things up. I heard a sharp bark and froze, then crept forwards a few feet. I reached the fork and was straining to see ahead when I heard the crunch and crack of something in the brush behind me. I spun and saw a pale man, six foot or taller, with dark hair, wearing a bright white t-shirt, about thirty feet from me. He gave me a lunatic grin, barked again, a hard sharp ha then turned and ran off into the woods. 
I stood still, scanning the trees, my hand on my gun. After not hearing anything for a few moments, I backtracked my way to the main trail. Then, terrified, Speed walked all the way back to my cabin. I hiked the exterior again that night, with a flashlight this time, and checked the coast for evidence of any visitor, boater, or wayward traveler. Nothing. I got up early morning, and in the light of day I did the same with the same result. I don't know who or what it could have been. The way he was running around off trail convinced me that he knew the island very well, better than me for sure, and that he was hiding out somewhere. But I never found any evidence of a secret lair, and I never saw him again. I don't know else how to say this, other than I just saw a titanic skeleton in the woods of Lassen National Park. I understand this place is usually reserved for fun, creepy stories, but I have genuinely never been more terrified or confused. What I'm seeing is real, and I can't think of what to do other than beg everyone who sees this to contact me and send help. An hour ago I was sitting on the front porch of my cabin watching the sunset, and out of nowhere this enormous rumbling filled the air. The type of rumbling that you can feel the vibration in your bones from. Concerned, my first thought was, maybe there's an earthquake. However, the problem with my earthquake hypothesis was that the ground wasn't shaking. It felt more like a rhythmic vibration, almost as if there were intervals. Clearly, it had to be something else, I thought. Simultaneously, I hear tree branches snapping violently out in the distance behind my cabin, and I can see flocks of birds freaking out desperately attempting to get away from that area. Not only that, I can see a thin layer of smoke or fog among the carnage. Immediately my mind jumped to this being an active rock slide, which meant I needed to act fast and prepare myself in case anything was coming toward me. As I scanned the area to see if anything was headed in my direction, my eyes stopped dead back around to where I had seen the first signs of trouble. For a solid minute I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I suppose that doesn't really do it justice. It was more like my brain completely denied the reality of what I was literally staring at. A hellish adaptation of a human skeleton towered over the trees. Note that I only say skeleton because while it was close to the proper shape of one, it was entirely covered by a black film. I would tell you that the film was the thing's skin, but it ungulated and popped in weird spots like an unfathomably extensive collection of maggots all moving in spastic and discontinuous patterns. Pieces of the black mass seemed to fall off as it moved through the trees and scrapped violently against branches. Its arms hung low to its sides, and massive three-fingered hands that fell below its kneecaps made no attempt to move the obstacles in front of it. Its long neck was the most inhumane part of its anatomy. If it was a regular-sized model, I'd assume someone had borrowed it from a horse or similarly shaped animal. Despite the goofy-looking nature of its neck, I could quickly tell its purpose was to allow the thing a much better range of movement to aid in its search for whatever it was looking for. This was made all the easier by the fact that it emitted two bright beams of light from its eyes that illuminated the woods below it. Silly as it sounds, it was like the thing had built-in searchlights that it used to scan every tiny being under its unrelenting gaze. By some miracle, the skeleton was a good enough distance away from me that it either hadn't noticed my presence or didn't care enough to inspect me. That being said, I was still effectively pinned down. Suppose I wanted to get in my car and drive off. In that case, that'd require me going into the cabin, finding my keys, starting my car, turning on my headlights, and manually opening a decently sized steel gate just down the road. There were enough steps in my head that I could very well alert it to my position. In an emergency, maybe I could plow through the gate. Still, considering the potential damage to my car, it may not have been usable to outrun the giant to the highway. Secondly, if I'm being honest, seeing that monster made me too frightened to move any part of my body anyway. Some of you may call me a coward, and that's fair. But when that early hominid part of your brain that saved our ancestors from cave lions and birds big enough to snatch children away tells you to stay put, you fucking stay put. Unfortunately, in staying put, I damn near almost lost my hearing when the skeleton opened its mouth and emitted what sounded like a profoundly distorted mule deer call. It searched around a small area for about ten minutes, calling out at different frequencies. All this before, I shit you not, I sneezed. It stopped in the middle of its call, waited a couple seconds, 
and briefly switched to what sounded like a child on a loud intercom and said, Hello? I felt my heart drop as the twisted puzzle pieces came together. Before I knew it, my hands were glued to my nose and mouth, fearing that the slightest breath would send it over to me in a frenzy. It took a single step in my direction and flashed those demonic eyes over my property. Luckily, the cabin blocked me from that wretched light, but I had clearly piqued its interest, and it was easily tall enough that it would be able to see me on the other side if it got close enough. It took another cautious step towards me and, at a lower frequency, repeated its inhuman question, Hello? At that moment, I knew I had to make a decision. Part of me was convinced there was a good chance that I would die, but that good chance would be a certainty if I didn't act. My only real shot at survival was running into my cabin, finding my keys within a few seconds, and making a mad dash for my car. I'd have to hope that even after smashing through the gate, my car would have just enough left to get me into town. It was a poor gamble. And all in all, I'd be giving up the one safety net I had in allowing it to know exactly where I was. Still, anything had to be better than the thing tiptoeing its way here, seeing me anyway and turning me into a paste in its maggot-filled throat. Fighting every urge to run into the woods and hide under a rock, I summoned the mental energy to prepare for what was coming next. Cursing myself in my mind, I slowly and quietly turned towards the door to begin a race for my life. But just as I had done so, I heard a groan in the distance. To my surprise, it sounded like that of an actual mule deer. The skeleton must have picked up on the noise at the same time. Its long neck immediately snapped in the direction of the sound. Its wretched searchlight eyes began flashing rapidly, and in the sloppy manner of a starving animal, it began to tear through the trees toward the noise, as if the prey it was silently stalking just moments ago never even existed. I took the opportunity to bolt back inside my cabin, grab my keys and hide under my bed with my phone, a rifle and a pillow to stifle even my most shallow breaths. It's been about an hour since it left, and I haven't heard anything from outside, but I'm too afraid to go out and check. I'm leaving as soon as the sun rises, but for now, I feel as trapped as I did when I was in the open. I made a quick call to 911 to try and explain to them what happened and request that they send as many units as possible out to me immediately. But as expected, they essentially thought I was on drugs and suggested that whatever I saw couldn't hurt me and just sleep it off. Texts to my friends aren't going through because of the shitty service. Trying not to break down from the frustration, I began typing this. At this point, all I can think to do is write up this story detailing my experience and post it online in hopes that my internet miraculously works and that one of you can contact someone who believes me and send help. Or in case it kills me, keep a final testament to my last few hours on earth. The least I can do is let the people that care about me know that I didn't go crazy out here or get eaten by a bear. If anyone has any idea what I'm dealing with, please give me the information I'm missing. I'm unsure if there are similar stories around Lassen, or if this is a first, but I need to know what's out there if I'm going to survive the night. Here's hoping. Once again, this isn't a joke for your entertainment. I'm not trying to scare anyone or be at the center of some urban legend. I'm just a really scared guy who's desperate for someone to believe him, and I'm begging everyone that reads this, please help me. Have you ever been driving down a familiar road and notice a landmark that stands out to you? In the city, you know where you are by the intersection or by your favorite stores and coffee shops. However, things are a little different on country roads. When driving down an unnamed path, you rely on natural landmarks like a unique-looking tree or an old truck on the side of the road. For me on the highway leading home, my marker was an old stone windmill. It had been standing there in a field on the side of the road since I was a small child. Not once in all those years did I ever see someone manning those fields. No tractor tilling the land, no lonely farmer with sweat on his brow. I always assumed it was simply abandoned and never bothered to ask about it. Yet despite my lack on connection, I always noted the lone windmill every time I passed it. It was a strange enigma that baffles me to this day. The windmill became a subject of many rumors at my local elementary school. Stories and legends went around and around, each more over the top than the last. Some say it belonged to an old farmer who killed his family and then hung himself from the rafters. 
Another story was that the building was alive. If you ever witnessed the old and rusty blades make a full rotation, then someone you love would die. Eventually, the allure of the mystery became too much, so a group of my friends and I decided to see if the rumors were true. In the warm summer sunlight, we ventured forth because none of us would dare to come at night. Every step towards the stone structure filled us with a strange sense of dread. The wind was completely still, as if even God feared those blades moving. We entered the shadow of its looming structure, and even the August heat couldn't stop the chill from running down our spines. Just as I reached for the rotting door, a massive gust of wind blasted us, and we heard the groaning of the ancient blades turning. We all ran with our metaphorical tails hanging between our legs. As I entered adulthood and moved away from my country home, the windmill vanished from my thoughts and my memories. As real fears such as bills and building careers rose, the imagined fears of youth seemed meaningless. That was until my father took ill and I had to drive back to his country home to see him. Driving those old deserted roads was like traveling backwards in time. As pavement turned to dirt and streetlights turned to the cold light of the full moon, I felt like I was leaving my adult life behind. I was that little boy looking out the school bus window again. I felt joy and nostalgia blowing through me. That was until I saw my familiar landmark. Jutting out of the earth like a man-made mountain was the lone windmill. With its stone base and metal blades gleaming in the moonlight, it looked just as it always had. But I also knew I had to settle this once and for all. It was the mystery of it all that kept drawing me in. All I had to do was go inside, and my fear would melt away. All I would find would be an old dusty windmill and some vacant cobwebs. Once I saw that I could move on with my life and close this silly chapter forever, I went back to my car and grabbed my emergency flashlight. With a determined nod, I made my way towards the dark shadow of the landmark. As I moved forward, I was brought back to that day as a child. I could feel that same dread sweeping over me. The idea of approaching this structure at night would have had ten-year-old me diving under the covers. However, I was no longer the cowardly child but a full-grown man with an understanding of the world and what was real. If that was the case, though, then why did I find myself shaking so much? I looked up at the stagnant blades against the light of the moon and dreaded them moving. I could feel my spine just waiting to tingle and shiver. I shook my head instead of my body and trudged forward. This would end now, one way or another. I grasped the cold handle of the old wood door and pushed it open. A grating sound of the degraded hinges squeaking could have woken the dead. I felt my heart pounding despite my best efforts to be brave. Slowly but surely I lifted my flashlight to the door frame, and with a sense of relief, I saw exactly what I thought I would. There was old rotting floor covered in dust, and in the corner was a dirty web with a solitary spider sitting in the middle. I chuckled at my fear and moved to turn around to leave when I heard a loud creak. I almost dropped my flashlight in shock. Memories of running back to the road flooded my mind and every instinct I had told me to do just that. However, I was not a child and would not resort to fear and irrationality. I turned back and began inching my way inside, praying that the rotting floorboards would withstand my weight. I placed my foot on the ground and heard it groan, but it held true. I let out a sigh of relief and began shining my light around the room. It was bigger than it looked from the outside, but almost completely empty. There wasn't so much as a rat roaming the floors. Then what the hell made that creaking noise? I asked myself. In answer, the sound rounded again from above me. Slowly, I raised my flashlight until it fell upon a pair of dead and blank eyes staring back at me. My blood went cold, and again my instincts told me to run, but my legs would not move. Instead, I moved my arm up, illuminating a haggard face of an old man. My light continued up to his arms, which were splayed wide by two pieces of wood. His torso bore cuts which looked like ruins engraved in his skin. The legends of the hanged farmer rang in my mind, but I knew that this wasn't that. That old man would be nothing but bones and dust by now, and yet this body was fresh, maybe a few weeks gone. I knew I had to call the police. This man's family deserved at least a little bit of peace. I lowered my light to grab my phone, but as I did, I caught another foot hanging at the other end of the room. I shakily rose my arm to reveal the hanged corpse of a young woman. Her body was fresher, maybe only a matter of days. 
I continued to shake, knowing and dreading what I had to do next. I forced my arm up, and as it rose, my jaw dropped. Strung from the bar of the windmill were dozens of corpses in different stages of decay. All the corpses had some sort of unknown symbol carved into their stomachs. Slowly the bodies swayed almost in unison and dark realization hit me. Inverted crosses, they were made into inverted crosses. I shone my light a little higher and on the ceiling above me drawn in blood was a pentagram. I could feel my roadside burger threatening to come up as the stench of death hit me. How I had not noticed the stench when I came in was beyond me. Maybe I hadn't wanted to smell it. It was in this moment that I discovered what terror was, not some made-up childlike fear, not some adulthood anxiety, but true, unadulterated terror. Every bone in my body turned to lead, my blood froze to ice, and my heart beat like pounding drum. At once I was that ten-year-old boy all over again, and I ran out of the room as fast as I could. As I made it to the field outside when I heard a sound that stopped me in my tracks, the windmill's blades began to move. The creak was almost deafening in the silence of the night. That was part of what made it so shocking. There was no wind whatsoever. I found my heading turning on its own accord toward that rusty, grating noise. The blades slowly turned a full 360 degrees, and then stopped as if they had never moved. All rational thought had left my body and all I wanted to do was get out of there. I jumped in my car and pelted down the dirt road as fast as my car would take me. Even after several minutes, I still found myself panicked. I kept checking my rearview mirror, half expecting the windmill to come rising over the hill like a giant movie lizard. Finally, when I turned down the road to my father's home, I felt some relief. That was until I pulled in the driveway and saw my younger sister standing on the porch crying, it turns out my father passed away not fifteen minutes ago. Had I came straight there, I would have been there when it happened. Instead, my sister faced my father's dying breath alone as he whispered about the winds blowing for him. I missed saying goodbye to my father, and that guilt will haunt me for the rest of my days. I told the police about what I had found at the windmill, and they did a full investigation. The bodies were connected to several drifters and missing persons in the area. They found bone fragments scattered around, and they believed that this had been going on for decades. They are investigating into the murderer, but I doubt they will ever find them. If their lair is discovered, they will simply move on to a new one. For there are so many other abandoned buildings out there, so many dense forests, so many dark caves. How many landmarks do people see every day on their commute, always being noticed but never questioned? What dark secrets might they hold? In college around 2004, my buddy decided to go on a solo camping trip in the Angeles Forest. It also might have been close to Mount Baldy. Not sure if it's the same area. Anyways, he went up by himself and parked down close to the entrance. It was already nighttime, so it was pretty dark. He said as he walked up to the entrance of the trail, there was a big rig parked on the side of the road with its lights off. He just figured someone was inside sleeping or it had been left there, but he didn't get any weird vibes from it. He hikes about twenty minutes into the trail and starts hearing things behind him. He chalked it up to just the sounds of the forest when you're alone, and intense paranoia. Anyway, he gets about thirty minutes in, and I guess he was just freaking out because it was so creepy and there were all sorts of noises. So he heads back to his car with his pack and everything. As he's walking out of the trail, he sees the big rig and a tiny light turns on in the back. Not enough to really see what's in there. He has to walk past the rig to get to his car. So when he's about ten feet away, all of a sudden, a dude inside the car pops his head up and, no joke, has a Freddy hockey mask on. He opens the door and my buddy straight up drops the shit he was carrying and runs for his life to his car. I am in my dorm with a few friends when we get this call from him, and he's full-on having a panic attack on the phone. We calm him down and he goes to the police station. They drive up to the trail with him and the rig is gone but his pack is still there, so he grabs it. They took a police report, but couldn't really do much else. Then, like a month later, some girl was hiking in the woods on the same trail, and she found a dead body, and in her police report she talked about seeing a parked big rig. I don't know exactly where it took place on which mat, but I can get some more info tomorrow and maybe find a link to the article. Creepy shit, though.